Okay, for uh, first things first, can everybody hear me okay? Um, okay, awesome. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the first time I'm giving a talk in person in, I'd say at least two years. Um, so, you know, very thankful and grateful for everyone that's, um, that's arrived to kind of see this in person. Um, I won't take that lightly. And also thank you to everybody that's tuning in via Zoom. Um, so again, since it's been a while, um, hopefully you'll forgive maybe uh, a little bit of the, the kinks or some parts for that might need a little bit more um, polishing or love than, you know, I've given it so far. But yeah, I'd love to just, um, just to go into just who I am and what I do. Um, you know, for most intents and purposes, um, you know, I, I, I go by a lot of titles, as will many of you, um, as you, you know, graduate and go out into the world. Um, graphic designer, creative director, art director. Honestly, um, there's nuances to each different one, but I think the, the term that I'm most comfortable with, I would say is graphic designer. I think, you know, it's something that really encapsulates all the different disparate kind of practices that I engage in and all the different activities um, kind of under one title. Uh, honestly, it's like when I use the term art director, creative director, it's, it's honestly just so a client pays me more. But, you know, just make no mistake, it's, it's, um, yeah, like I'm, I'm a graphic designer through and through. Um, you know, I, I've worked at places big and small um, and I've learned a lot and I've taken a lot from kind of each experience and I just would love to just go through and just kind of share those things. I think I would say if I had to pick um, a first love or something that I really love to do is that I, I really love to work with brands, but more specifically, I really love to get my hands dirty with letter forms. I love creating logos, typefaces, um, you know, yes, a lot of times it comes together with illustration and image making into a piece of design, but I would say if I had to just pick one kind of lane to stick in for the rest of my life, I'd love to just, you know, do lettering, typefaces, um, and logos. And so a lot of my work and a lot of my practice is kind of orbiting around that. Um, I also, you know, do do a lot of image making and illustration. It's something that I'm also very passionate and, and heavy about, but I think, you know, the study and the act of just creating and designing letter forms. Um, there's a lot in there already of, of history, of culture, of different people's practices that, you know, there's, a, there's almost kind of enough to talk about and kind of sustain me. And so, you know, as Langston pointed out, I, I, I left my corporate job at Nike uh, three years ago to start my own studio again. Um, and it's been pretty great so far, but I think mostly what I wanna talk about today is, about just the labels, the rules, the tools, the software frameworks, the philosophies, um, all the little things that you know we use to try to categorize who we are and and kind of what we do. Um, you know, there's there's the design thing. Um, there's a design component to it that I think you know ends up kind of affecting what we do for better or worse. And this definitely is kind of like a toxic love story to I think the do's and don'ts of this world, but. I think even beyond design, um, there's just a lot of labels that we like to use to describe ourselves. And, you know, it's not just a trend in design, it's also just like a larger um, kind of phenomenon that we engage in. Like you take a personality test, you're now an ENFP. Um, you go see a psychiatrist, now you're neurodivergent. You have ADHD, you have BPD. Um, you go work at Facebook, you're gonna learn about agile um, software design or Six Sigma. You go work at Google, you're gonna learn the phrase, don't be evil. And so, you know, there's, there's so many kind of rules and, and do's and don'ts to try to pay attention to. Um, and you're gonna meet a lot of people throughout your, your education and also your career that might try to sway you in one lane or another and say like, this is the right way to do something, this is not the right way. Um, and people are gonna be very opinionated about it. But I think what interests me is not so much the rules themselves, but I think how we sort of arrive to it. And, you know, there's even a whole category of art and design that is just about, Rule making in general, from John Baldessari to Sister Curie to Kent. Um, a lot of people have tried to just encapsulate like years and decades worth of experiences into like a top 10 rule thing. This was, early, you know, way before BuzzFeed, way before Tumblr, you know, way before Instagram. Um, you know, people were really trying to figure out like, what does it mean to be an artist or to be a designer that practices and makes work? You know, what are activities and practices that will sustain you longer than, you know, what will not sustain you. But, you know, all in all, like, this is just something that I've just kind of preoccupied with myself um, for a long time. I think just to start, um, you know, I 
I was born in LA uh, in a mostly Asian American um, kind of Chinatown kind of population that's kind of similar. And so, you know, early on, I think in my childhood, like I was really just kind of exposed to just a lot of different scripts, a lot of different languages across the signs and the storefronts that I saw. But it was also just like, you know, being a child of immigrants, I, I kind of existed under two worlds where, um, you know, when it felt like when I went to school, you know, I had to put on like my Western civilization hat and I, I had to go through the motions and learn about what it means, you know, to live in America and to, to follow the rules of America. And then the moment I, I kind of left school, I was back into my world, which was the world of my parents, which was a lot more tethered to, you know, the culture where they came from. And so I think very early on from an early age, I was accustomed to the idea that, you know, you might be an individual and you enter somewhere, but, you know, when you walk into the door somewhere, there might be just a whole set of unspoken rules, frameworks, you know, expectations of you. And learning how to switch at that at such an really early age, I think had a very kind of profound impact on me. But, you know, at the same time, I, I got into design at a very early age. And I, you know, I, I owe this a lot to Los Angeles and, you know, the built environment and the culture around that. I think everything from handmade signs to, you know, storefront signages in multiple languages to the graffiti on the streets and on the freeways. I think it taught me very early on that letters had the capacity to function exactly like images. And like images, they also had this kind of storytelling capacity um, that was really rich. And when you get to know a letter form and why someone might use a letter form, you know, that's a window and an insight into someone's own story and their history and their culture and where they're coming from and what they're trying to do with that, whether it's to sell you something or to tell a story or to convince you of an ideology. You know, there's so much power, I think, in the details of letter forms too. I think also at the time, you know, this might be more of a banality than a novelty, but, you know, I, I grew up with the internet and I was, I think, the first generation that remembered a life before the internet, but also was in the internet really early on that it was just native to me. And so I got my start in design through um, web design, um, making websites when I was 12. And there was also this just this cool, I think I was exposed to this whole graphic language around web design too, that was very different and almost like the opposite of what I was used to around me too. And so I think another kind of big thing that happened when I was, was younger was that, um, you know, my, my family came from a really strict kind of Buddhist upbringing, but my parents converted to Christianity um, when I was, was 13. So right at the precipice of like puberty and like where one's discovering their sexuality and things like that, it was almost as if like morals shifted 180 degrees one night, things that were once deemed you know, progressive and open was now forbidden and things that were once forbidden were now permitted. And, and so that was really hard to get used to. But I think all this to say is that like, I, I, I think I was thrown around like a rag doll when it came to rules. Um, and I think that kind of made me really, I think for the longest time, really apprehensive to rules. And, and so, you know, I had my whole kind of teen angst phase. And, um, you know, I think you see a lot of graffiti in LA and you like fonts and typefaces you might try to actually do some. So, you know, here is a, a scan of my, um, of a corp document uh, when I got arrested on Mother's Day uh, for spray painting <laughs> graffiti on the wall. But um, there's just this one section that kind of stood out in particular where it was like minors future plans are to become a graphic designer. Uh, minor states that he's currently working on his portfolio. Um, so I think that is the, the first record I knew where I, um, I didn't tell my parents then, but I, I think they, they found out while, while they're in court, um, you know, and so I think they, they were kind of surprised and, but I think, you know, I think the right, it was clear where the thing that I love to do, um, I was really, I love letters and I was interested in letters. The way I expressed that was maybe outside the bounds of what is legal in the United States and what is practical. And I needed to find a different way to express my interest in letters. And so I enrolled in, a, in Art Center College of Design. Um, and so Art Center is a school on the West Coast. And it's, sometimes it felt more like a trade school than, than like a, an undergraduate kind of education. But Art Center, um, you know, the, the teachers there were, were trained by um, Swiss practitioners. And so they really believed in 
this kind of classical modernist um, a view of graphic design. You know, some of these works you might have seen before, but I think it was a place where really it was like form follows function, design should be neutral, design is problem solving. And that was really my first exposure to, you know, coming from just like all these, you know, a rule breaking or a very kind of um, working class, um, diverse kind of affinity to letters. I was suddenly learning that there was a canon that, you know, an established history, a history that was, you know, mostly white, uh, male centric and male dominated, but a history nonetheless that they told me that was, you know, the only history and I had to just really digest that. And, you know, a lot of my career is just as much of realizing where, you know, where my influences are, because this is something that influences me a lot, but it's also, also unlearning that this is the only acceptable um, kind of history. But, you know, I just been, I just almost kind of hit the jackpot where I studied with two, you know, teachers in typography, Leah Hoffmitz and Simon Johnston, who um, trained directly under Wolfgang Weingart, um, who was another Swiss designer that I really looked up to um, in Switzerland. And so they really kind of just engrossed me into the whole history of it. And I just kind of just did my best. And, you know, the first year, as many of you might have also experienced, was like, you know, no computers at all and, and doing things, I think, the proper way. And what I was lucky was that, you know, before my frontal lobe was developed, I I gained a framework on how to deconstruct and look at the world around me. You know, a lot of design principles that you might learn like repetition or contrast, um, you know, you start to really see that kind of play out in the world where the stakes are maybe higher and the implications are a little bit larger. And so, you know, this was just really kind of this early exposure to people that created the rules and people that broke the rules at the same time. And, but I think as I went on through my education, I started realizing that these rules as helpful as they might be, there's a lot of performative, um, there's a lot of performativity or a lot of theater to it, you know? Um, I think we, you know, in school, I learned so much about like the grid, um, having a structure, having things line up and having things be rational. You know, I think everybody's probably seen the thing on the bottom right where people try to make up these like kind of lines and ex like all these like invisible kind of guides and scaffolds about this is why there's a bite out of the apple. You know, a lot of it's bullshit. Um, a lot of it really is to just was made specifically to sell design as something to take seriously. But it's also, what was also interesting was that this was always in school seen as like, you know, you had classical design which was like the graphic design dark ages. And suddenly in the 1950s, Helvetica came around and everything kind of changed, but that's really not true. I mean, grids are, for example, seen as like a recent invention, but ever since the printing press was invented, we've been trying to um, rationalize things and have like an internal kind of structure. Um, Aldous Manutius, one of the earliest printers in Venice um, in the 16th century, you know, the more we uncovered his books and what he printed, we realized that it wasn't just you know, random letters formed together on a letterpress set, you know, there was a grid, there was a structure, there was an internal um, order to things. And there also was, you know, a set amount of proportions um, and a pattern, you know, to, to even just how the letter forms existed. And they were all really interconnected and related. And they kind of use the, you know, what, if you go design at Dropbox or Facebook or Google, for example, you might, get told like the Fibonacci sequence is like a, a magical number, but for them, you know, they had their own set of like magical numbers and magical proportions and, and rules to think too. And that was what was important to them. But, you know, I think when we look back at history, I think we oftentimes really kind of overcomplicate things. And so, you know, the letter forms that we use today, the Latin alphabet, A, you know, A, B, C, D, all the way to Z, um, you know, we could thank the Romans for that. And so the letters have been around for thousands of years. And so we lost a lot of information about Roman culture and Roman society um, as Europe entered into the Middle Ages or what was previously known as the Dark Ages. So by the time they happened, you know, the Renaissance happened, they were just really fetishizing a lot of like what the Romans did. So it was like this rediscovering Roman like philosophy and Greek philosophy and rediscovering you know, the classics as they called them, they're like, there has to be a reason for everything. And so when we look at these letter forms, um, you know, by the time the Renaissance happened, 
I think we, and I say we as like Europeans, even though not everyone here is European, but just pretend with me for a second. They kind of assumed that like these letter forms all had like a whole proportionate reason to them. So you had things like the Roman du Ra where, you know, they drew like a serif letter G and they try to say like, okay, there's a circle here and this is why this curve is the way it is. And, you know, there's this grid and there's this line and that there's this proportion, but a lot of it was just really a projection. We were just really just taking our, what we fetishized and what we cared about um, in our present. And we applied it to something that we just assumed they would believe the same things we did, even though this was thousand, this is like more than a thousand years of difference in history and culture. And so what's, what's also just really kind of weird is that, you know, when we talk about grids and we talk about lines and stuff is that even in the most basic atomic, you know, fundamental building blocks of what we do is it doesn't really make sense, right? Like when you say like everything should line up and look like they're in the same size, if you do it mathematically, um, you know, it's not going to look right where th this is mathematically center, this is mathematically at the same size, but the square kind of looks off, the circle looks a little bit small. Um, and you really have to just adjust the shapes and like make the triangle a little bit bigger so that it visually looks closer to the square. Um, you know, there's another thing where it's like, I, I love to just even illustrate, it's like the Pogendorf illusion. So even if you just draw a diagonal line through a solid shape, um, like here, when you have it clear and it's just like, when you're dealing with just the line shape, you know, it makes sense that this looks like a connected line, but suddenly when one of the shapes is a lot solid, um, and you draw a line through it, on the right side, the line looks kind of lower than where you would almost expect it to be. Like it, it, it feels like there's something kind of off about it. And so, and that's just really because our eyes aren't made for math. Our eyes are really just, you know, our eyes are very organic um, organs that are just perceiving a very organic world around us. And so, you know, to really compensate for this illusion, for example, you actually have to break up this line um, so that it looks right. And so a lot of times it's like we break a rule to make somebody, to convince somebody that we followed a rule, which is, which is something that is like strange the more and more I think about it, right? And so, okay, where would this apply? I think, you know, the simplest explanation is the letter X. Um, a lot of non-designers think that the letter X is one of the easiest um, letter forms to draw. It's just, you know, two diagonal lines, but it's because of this illusion and the, the fact that you have to maintain um, the, the feeling that it looks right, you have to just break this very fundamental rule. And so, you know, as we learn to get kind of more visually literate and whatnot, you start realizing like, what are some tools that we use at like what's, what's default and, and what's not default? And, um, you know, what is, you know, what is acceptable? And you'll notice like, if you look at a typeface design software, um, like Robofont, which is used by most of the industry, it doesn't come with a circle tool. Um, which seems like a big kind of oversight, right? But I think the whole point of it was that like, you know, the team that worked on it was that my circle is in your circle. It's very rare to ever have a perfect circle appear when you're drawing letters and you're doing typefaces. You know, you always have to optically adjust it, like um, to be a little bit more bulgy on the side or a little bit less bulgy so that it almost looks right, right? And so they thought it was an important kind of tool where, um, it, it, if they had a default tool, they, they felt that maybe it was gonna push people to only just rely on that tool and not really try to draw a circle themselves. And so when you look at another competing software like Glyphs, a software that's also used for type design and they do have a circle, a lot of times you could almost tell when somebody made design something in Glyphs because it starts looking a lot more geometric because they have those tools. And when you're just starting out, you really wanna change, you know, go to these defaults. You know, the fact that Myriad is the default typeface um, in Illustrator, you know, there's, there's consequences to that. And there's, there's, there's almost like a whole culture about it. So when we go back to this and we think about the whole rationalizations, like what was the actual truth? Well, the reason why we came up with this whole backstory and this fake lore about why this is a rational shape and why this G is shaped the way it was is because when we are dealing with Roman history, we're looking at letters carved in stone. And that feels like such a permanent act where you just can't, you can't just freestyle it as you go along. So they have to draw on a plan too, right? But you know, what happened was like, there's a Jesuit priest um, in close around the 1960s that discovered that like the answer was a lot more dumb and simple than we actually thought. And what, you know, 
because of his religion and because of his religious practices, you know, Father Kadic was a lot really, he was around a lot of these like kind of inscribed um, and written kind of letter forms and he was really familiar to it. And he surmised that, um, you know, I think they might've done it the way we've done it where they start with a sketch on the actual stone and then they paint the letters in and then when it looks right, that's when they finally, you know, start chiseling it in stone. And, you know, he was later proven right, where when we started excavating um, more things in Italy and like looking at ancient Roman ruins, we did see like this almost kind of graffiti kind of thing that was going on where they were painting the letter forms in before they were drawing them in. And they found out that because of the way you hold the brush um, and the way you lift up the brush and what's a graceful shape, that these seraphs just appeared kind of naturally um, just because of just how the brush worked, that it didn't look right if you lift your brush only, so you had to balance out the other side. And so Father Kadic published this book called The Origin of the Seraph, and it's all about that, where seraphs came from. And that might seem kind of like a silly, maybe frivolous kind of dumb thing to really look into, but really it, it taught something really kind of interesting to us where we're so used to almost like a genetic or a collective memory that this letter has looked and was written this way for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years that it just kind of looks right to us, even though we might not have the tools to communicate why it looks right and why it looks, you know, why it doesn't look right. But what's more and more true is that like the tools we use inform the marks we make that, you know, some of you might be toying with design software right now, like Figma, um, you know, or Illustrator or other kind of softwares, but it's really interesting to try to see like why, like why are tools the default and why are tools, you know, the way they are and what kind of work does that kind of engender? But not only that, but like, does a management style produce a certain type of work over another type of work? Does a religion produce a certain type of person over another person, right? And in a world that's always just pressuring you to just pick a lane and kind of stick to it or specialize or, or have a philosophy that you go by, you know, these things kind of feel like larger, more consequential um, decisions, right? And so I think for me, when I was younger, someone that I grew up with the internet um, and somebody that was really interested with technology, but also into the history of printing and, and books, I think in undergrad on the left, I was doing like these kooky experiments where I was like, can you make a book that's like a museum catalog that's interactive when you're in the museum and you could put the book on a kiosk or, uh, you know, this was um, on the image on the right was like experiments I did in grad school where can I have a video of me walking a city block, but I have to walk an actual block to play that video. And when I stop walking, the video stops. And it was, it was a lot of things I was really trying to experiment towards. It's like, how do you make, you know, digital things like real feel physical? And, you know, I think at some point I got really into just, I think drawing with my mouse. And what was interesting about drawing with my mouse was that, you know, if, as, if anyone's tried to actually draw something on in paint or in Illustrator, there's a, there's a kind of interesting thing that happens where it's, it's on the computer. And so it should feel easy, but it's actually really hard. If not, it's harder than to draw on paper, um, not because it's a harder tool, but because it's a more unforgiving tool, meaning it highlights all your mistakes. Um, you know, if, you're, if your hand shakes and tilts a little, it's not really a mistake, it was designed like that. It will record that, that markdown as your hand shakes and as you, you know, are trying to get used to that tool. But at the same time, you know, because of how a vector works or the line, it's also really smooth at the same time. And so drawing on the mouse end, ended up being this really interesting kind of thing for my practice where it was something that felt both physical and digital at the same time, where it was clear that I did this by hand, but it was such a, it was, you know, everything was done on, clearly at the same time done on the computer. And to the point where I started programming my own kind of drawing software um, and seeing how that looked where, you know, this is just drawing in Illustrator and, you know, that engendered one, some kind of mark. And as I got used to it and I started learning it, it, it became kind of an extension of my practice. But when I started programming my own software, you know, my marks became different. And so this is where that truism really comes to place where the tools we use really inform the marks that we make. And so I think if you're using the same kind of software as your classmates, there's a range and there's a whole range of perspectives and experiences that you're bringing in, right? And the work isn't gonna look like your classmates if you're, you know, if you try to stay true to telling, you know, or expressing an experience or something that you're familiar with, but really, you know, 
it's a lot of the subtle design of these tools and these softwares will influence you know, how things look and how things really react. And so I started in grad school, I was doing like Chinese calligraphy with these, you know, drawing pencils. And I started to, as I got more serious into type design, I discovered like, you know, I had a whole different kind of world. And I was really grateful that I found the teachings of Herod Nordzeit where, um, you know, we break down typefaces by serif or sans serif. And that was something that felt kind of weird to me because sometimes like a serif typeface will kind of look closer to a sans serif than another sans serif might look to the serif. And so we realize that the things we take for granted as like, this is one way of looking at the world, um, you know, it's, it's really also somebody else made that up too. And so to make a long story short, I think when Nordzeit, he wanted to go about it a different way where he broke down, not just the Latin alphabet, but this applies for Devanagari, this applies for other scripts as well. Um, it was more about um, the tool that you used and the stroke modulation. So on the left side, you have something that's called translation. On the right side, you have expansion. Um, and just to say simply, it's the right side is like, you know, a fountain pen or a quill brush where the more pressure you apply, the thicker the line gets. You know, just save that for later. That's outside of the scope of this kind of discussion. But what was really interesting and what was really helpful was the idea of translation where, you know, a lot of the, a lot of what I was trying to wrestle with when I started was before I even got into art school and I was like just looking at letters when I was a kid was like why are these two different shapes like this A and this C they're different things but they somehow look like they're the same font and somebody put them in the same font and I'm convinced that it's the same font and you know I realized like it really what I was really asking was like why are some parts thin and why are some parts thick when you look at a letter and what's familiar about that and I think when I learned about how Nords I dealt with translation was like a lot of the tools that were available when we really started getting developing calligraphy as a practice that was modern um, was a broadened pen and it's a flat pen um, with a really flat brush and you'll notice that there's these like kind of arrows that are pointing at a 30 degree angle and it doesn't change well basically you're drawing the letter on the left and the letter on the right they're skeleton it's the same skeleton but if you look at the letter on the left they're drawing it with the flat pen and they're not changing their angle. And as they go through it, just like the mathematical concept of translating a vector, you know, you start to see that as they keep their angle consistent, things end up naturally being um, thin in some parts and things end up naturally being thick. Like if you look at this asterisk, maybe it'd be hard to see, if you draw a vertical line down, it's really thick. But if you draw a diagonal line from left to right, um, you know, it's also thick. But if you draw it from right to left, which is the same angle that you're going off of, because it's a broad knit pen, it becomes thin. And it's, it's one of those things where you almost kind of want to see it in practice. But as you start to lay it with that, I started just looking at letters differently after that, where you almost kind of just caught the angle that they're going through and that they're drawing down and tracing this kind of shape. And, you know, if you add a couple little more details, this becomes a garamond. You know, if you draw the letters a different way, it becomes a black letter. And this was just really interesting for me to really try to figure out like that everything was just really a few set of rules and then, you know, a specific tool and they kind of changed it. But what made this, you know, a different language or a different idea was really the culture and the kind of meaning behind it. And so this is a principle, you know, you could bring your own kind of culture and history when you draw a black letter, but it's still the same principle of getting an angled brush and drawing at a consistent angle and lifting your pen. And you could almost kind of see like some spots are darker than others. You could almost kind of see where the pen started and where the pen lifted up and where some shapes overlapped and where some shapes didn't. But it also applies in graffiti at the same time, like where there's, you know, even when you're trying to draw something messy or you're trying to break the rules, there's a consistent angle that kind of comes across. And a lot of happens when new technology comes around. So as I mentioned, growing up in LA, I was really attracted to, you know, the the Chicano, um, the Hispanic kind of lettering that was around me. And so I think it gets a bad rap of being like gang influence, but it really was just kind of its own culture in and of itself. And so for reasons that are maybe outside of the scope of this conversation, but short, long story short, um, colonialism, you know, there was a lot of affinity towards like black letter, um, you know, due to the Catholic church, due to, you know, the Spanish who were there and subjugated, um, you know, the, the local indigenous folks and 
there was this affinity to black letter, but you know, this was graffiti that was done with the brush in the early 1940s. The spray paint was invented in 1949. And by 10 years, you know, LA graffiti transformed from this classical black letter to almost this kind of new script, this what, what is colloquially called as um, cholo writing. Um, and you know, what people don't might not realize is, is that they all have the same ancestor and that this was specifically an adaptation of technology where a letter form like on the left is really hard to draw in a single continuous stroke, but it's very easy to draw with a paintbrush. But now when you have a, um, a spray can, you can't really fill in the, you know, make things thick and make things not. So within a short time frame, within 10 years, that letter E, through the effort of trying to draw it continuously with a line, the, the underlying skeleton and the underlying structure kind of changed. But when you really compare all the letter forms together, you know, a clear lineage is really, you know, seen and really developed. And so this is something that looks very different, but it is more or less, you know, I'm not trying to invalidate like the cultural history behind it. I'm not trying to say that there isn't a deeper story behind it. What I'm saying is that sometimes all it takes is a catalyst where it's a new piece of software or a new methodology to do something. A lot of times, so much happens and so much changes in how you make a graphic mark and how you have a visual language, you know, just because of these incidental kind of catalysts, right? And so I think over the years, like in thinking about what I call like a rule theater, um, you know, I don't think I'm someone that breaks rules, um, you know, consistently. I think also for cultural reasons and so for personal reasons, trauma, et cetera, I'm, I'm someone that I've been told more or less to not rock the boat, but. I've also just like, I'm naturally skeptical of things too, but it, it was almost like too much for me to react in a way where it's like, I'm specifically breaking this rule. And so I think over time, I found myself kind of existing in this weird in-between space where I started to really think about what I call rule horizons. You know, the exact moment when a rule starts to no longer make sense, but it's not broken yet. And that's just been a useful way for me to deconstruct my own work. and to develop our own practice and you know what I'm interested in. And you know, I think when you're when you graduate and you go out into the world or into your internships, you're gonna learn a lot of mantras, right? Um, you're gonna learn less is more and you're gonna they're gonna tell you like there's certain cultures that adhere to that and not. And they're like, look at the minimalism of Japanese design. But you realize really quickly that you look at any website in Japan and it doesn't look like the image on the right, you know, that these things are culture specific because and you might see this with Chinese websites too, because, you know, in, culturally, there's a lot of emphasis placed on having the right information and, and, and appearing that you're competent when you're using a service or hiring somebody. So if something looks really clean and minimal, it gives you the feeling that like, maybe they're hiding something or maybe they don't know as much. And so, you know, you start to gravitate towards services and websites where it's like, I, it has all the information I need so that I can make the best informed decision for myself, you know? when you say less is more, it's like try telling that to a Persian rug, um, as Milton Glaser would say. Can you tell a Persian rug that less is more? No, and it's, it's one of those things where every little thing, you know, makes sense. But I think even when you look at contemporary product design, you know, less is more also falls apart even within our own culture. You know, I think a lot of you, you know, I'm assuming that almost everyone in this room has Venmo um, just because it's useful, but you also might see in the app on the right, which is Cash App, but you know, why is Cash App more popular? Why is Cash App a lot less popular than Venmo? Like by, by orders of 10, actually. When Cash App, you know, by all intents and purposes through your education and through not, you could point at Cash App and say, that is a more clear, coherent design. That is a more minimal design. That is more clean design. That is a more friendly design. But why is Venmo more popular? And I think the same kind of mechanisms are also in place where, you know, Cash app is so simple, so approachable, so friendly, but you know what is also approachable, friendly, and simple? Um, an action figure or a toy, right? And so cash app is gonna always feel like a toy compared to Venmo. And so it feels you know, less serious. And if you're talking about like a dating app, maybe you want your dating app to feel more fun and approachable and a toy. But when you're talking about money, how many of you, you know, think about money and have to deal with it and want like your bank to make it feel like it's, you know, a kid castle. I don't think any of you would raise your hand too. And so there's specific contexts where, you know, these things kind of break down. And just like I said, with technology, it's like, you know, when you look, 
if you, you know, get into design history and you read about like Emigre magazine, for example, you know, they had a lot of interesting ideas that were really challenging the graphic kind of nature of that time. But a lot of it's also just the invention of the Macintosh and desktop publishing. And so, you know, I think like, you know, when you, you might even hear terms in history where there's modernism, postmodernism, and late modernism, um, or hypermodernism, or all these new terms. But I think for me, it's where I don't actually think postmodernism has actually happened yet. I think, you know, just like late capitalism is capitalism, but with contradictions. I think right now we're in a modernist age, but we're just stress testing these modernist ideals and we're striking out contradictions within that. And so, you know, in thinking about that, the idea of like a rule horizon, you know, that becomes really interesting for me. And what's sustained my practice is the idea of like a malicious compliance where rather than breaking any rules per se, I, I really try to follow them to the point where they almost don't make sense on their own. Um, and this isn't something I did, but this is an example that of what I think is like a rule horizon that really warms my heart. Um, this was a cover a few years ago, um, a Chelsea Manning's cover for the New York Times Magazine. Um, and this was led by Gail Bickler and her amazing design team. But I think one of the cool kind of details was the subheadline becoming Chelsea Manning. Because um, when you learn design, you learn about hierarchy, right? Like putting a headline big and putting something in the top left, that's going to signify it's the most important thing. And, you know, the design team did something special where they did a subheadline that just directly goes across the New York Times thing. But the, the hierarchy still actually comes in place. So this is something that seems like it's breaking a rule where it's like just saying like, fuck it. And it's just overlaying a piece of type on top. But it's actually just, you know, actually just an inherent kind of contradiction to that rule. And it's not really breaking it at all because you see the hierarchy where the New York Times Magazine has a mess head that's so familiar that you almost don't recognize that it's there. Like you kind of just see it and like that's the New York Times. And so it gives rule, you know, room for you to have like the becoming Chelsea Manning to almost occupy that same kind of space and actually be heavier than the New York Times Magazine visually where it all just kind of makes sense and it reads it. And so even when I'm just like doing hand-drawn type and I'm, you know, doing things that, that feel really hand-drawn, I think there's always, you know, an inherent kind of structure, you know, rationality, you know, to how I deal with the layouts that I'm really attracted to the idea of like, these disparate kind of ideas, like no matter how maximalist or how aggressive I could be with my design, that there's still some underlying grid and structure to it. But it's really in following that, that I show, that I actually make the difference a lot more distinct. That if everything were all over the place, then everything's in its right place at the same time. If everything's big, nothing's big, right? And so I really, this is really just coming back to those old principles of design that I resonated with. You know, I've always been attracted to singular gestures as well. Like everybody knows the anarchy symbol on the left, but you know, in the, in the 60s um, in the Netherlands in Holland, when they were dealing with their problems with the monarchy, um, these anarchists put up this other poster and we're, um, we're more or less almost at the anniversary. Like we just passed the anniversary of it, but it's March 10, the day of anarchy. And all they did was just, they got a letter A and flipped it backwards where you know, the symbol on the left is something that is iconic and something that you know, I can't take away and there's so much cachet to it. But I've always been attracted to the symbol on the left when you just do one thing, you know. And so in my own work, it's something that just like sometimes it's just one kind of gesture um, to really just highlight, you know, how disorderly this kind of world that we live in where everything else is more or less, you know, maintained as an orderly kind of form. And so I also, you know, really because of my school and its connection to advertising, I was also just really interested in you know, big ideas too. Like when I'm designing a furniture store, um, you know, can I make it look like a floor plan? Can I make the letters just feel like the, like a maze in somebody's apartment? And so for me, it's like really like, you know, you, you're, when you graduate and you go out, you're going to be introduced to all these really interesting processes like post-it notes on the wall. How do you digest the problem and things like that? But I think for me, I always really try to factor in like sometimes it doesn't really have to be that deep and sometimes really the dumbest impulse you know there's a reason why you might have that kind of first impulse through it and so it got to the point where you could even change the typeface but because the letters are arranged in a specific way and it's not really about the font that you could actually break you know kind of rules and go have a little bit of freedom you know as a brand that you wouldn't really have you know can I make a jewelry brand you know can I make the letters cut like diamonds and so this is really kind of just the equivalent of a dad joke, but that's really just how I work, right? And, you know, 
you know, something that I, I did recently that I was really fond of was Accomplice. Um, it's a fashion brand started by two lovers, um, not husband and wife, but boyfriend and girlfriend. And, and so they're really kind of different people, but they really see themselves as having connected. And so all I did for Accomplice was, you know, I set the typeface and the two letter C's are set in a temp similar typeface where the weight is almost similar and you can't tell the difference, but the two C's are in a sans serif rather than a serif. And those two C's really just represent like this kind of dynamic duel that's against the world. And so, you know, I do try to think of storytelling, but I don't really try to tell the entire story. You know, I, I, I leave a little bit of ambiguity in there and I'm not really, you know, I think in a world that talks about communication and accessibility, I think those are values that I really care about, but I really care about them to a certain point. And I think when you're in the business of creating mythologies and myths and like worlds and lores and legends and storytelling, you know, sometimes it's what you leave out in a story that tells more than what you actually leave in. And so, you know, even in my lettering and a lot of my work, I, I, it's like you really kind of go back to those principles of like translation. And so like once I learned how, you know, that's how letters really functioned, you know, I realized that a lot of times, like even sometimes when you look at something where this doesn't look like anything like Garamond or Bodoni, but the same mechanisms are maybe in place that, you know, it actually doesn't need to take that much effort to, to make something different. Like, I think it's, it's always going to be an interesting gesture when you break something. And when you say like, fuck something, and it's like, I'm not going to follow the rules, but I like to think of it as a spectrum. I think there's a whole spectrum between following a rule and breaking it that I really think where, you know, the more I spend time in the middle, the more I actually learn more about, you know, the methodologies of people and what they do. And so, you know, even principles like repetition, where it's like, I'm designing a magazine for the future of food and I use this typeface. Well, it's like, can I make, can I get the letter X of that typeface and repeat it so that it almost looks like the lining of a cow's stomach because this article is about a cow's stomach? You know, can I make a letter look like fungus with the same typeface? And can I, it's a lot of my, what I do in my practice is like, how can I, if there's a dead horse, how can I beat that dead horse? Sorry for the imagery, but I, I, I don't have any other better metaphor for that. But it's also just like, where do we decide to break these rules? Where do we decide to make something different and something the same? And so, you know, I think a lot about resilience and, and what I've arrived at was like the least amount of rules possible. Um, and I think the last thing I'll really go deep into is like um, this, the branding I did for Nike Lab. And so for those who don't know about Nike Lab, Nike Lab is a sub-brand of Nike and it's their platform to collaborate with other brands. So on the left, it's um, Nike collaborating with the streetwear brand called Off-White. And so they're using some of the brand signifiers that Off-White has. On the right side is Nike collaborating with Sakai. So the challenge was interesting where it's like, how do you make something look like Nike, but not Nike at the same time so that it doesn't look like a completely Nike thing and it leaves room for somebody else. And that was something that they were dealing with with the brand at the time where it looked too much like a Nike product when this is all about collaboration. And so, what I never do is like, I never try to do 180 degree um, rebrands where it's like, let's start over. I, I really try to look at the history and, and just try to really configure things too. And so what I noticed was that like the Nike lab had logo was in three kind of parts. There was a rotated swoosh and people had gotten so familiar where Nike fanboys knew that if the swoosh was rotated 90 degrees, they knew it was like a luxury product and it was a Nike lab product. So it's like, okay, let's not change that. Let's, that's an industry that's, what we call brand equity, but it's something that's interesting and we want to keep it interesting because people have associated this. And then there was these eight ticks. And what does these eight ticks stand for? You know, it was more or less like kind of corporate speak where I was like, the eight ticks represent eight of Nike's innovation from Nike era to Flyknit. And it's like, okay, well, I don't know how anybody could tell that. So there's almost kind of no point to keep that, right? But at the same time, it's like, I don't, again, I don't like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So it's like, let's maybe kind of reuse it where the eight ticks are, are more useful and interesting. And I think the least interesting part is where it says Nike lab. Right. And I think the thing about typography where typefaces are kind of like the arbiter of, or like the barometer of taste. Sometimes it's like, sometimes the wrong font just makes, just kind of ruins everything where something looks outdated all of a sudden, something looks inappropriate. So that was the most contentious part of it. So let's, you know, so with the eight ticks, I kind of configured them around to be like, you know, eight grids, four on the top and four at the bottom. And so I arrived at this brand um, where I like to think of it as Lego pieces, where you have Nike Lab on the left, which is with the Nike Lab typeface with a rotate swoosh. 
But again, where I said like people just recognize that the rotated swoosh was Nike Lab. So you actually didn't really have to say Nike Lab too. You could take it out and then you could have the most minimal logo. And to me, it was the same logo. You just add different Lego pieces in different situations and you know for different purposes. And so you could have Nike Lab really spelled out. Um, but if you had it on the product and you didn't have Nike Lab, it was okay. But when you don't say Nike Lab, now you're able to put you know, the, the other brand in there. And so now this logo almost became a system in of itself where you, you know, they knew they could put the other collaborators logo on the left side and it reads as like a collaboration. Um, you know, normally the way they did this before is like they write the name of the brand then they write X and then they write Nike. But now with this thing, it was just something where, you know, I was trying to stay true to that purpose as much as possible but I was just trying to consolidate things and make things a lot more kind of useful because if it wasn't useful, then why have it in the first place? Um, and so it got to the point where it was like, you could draw anything in here. Um, and, but also like collaborators got to pick what kind of swoosh they wanted. You know, it's like, if you wanted to make something look more sporty, you could pick the swoosh on the right instead of the retro one. Um, you know, if you're Virgil Abloh, rest in peace, you could, instead of having these boxes, you could have your signature ticks. You could have your signature, you know, graphic outline, you know, it, it gave, brands this chance to actually like break the logo as much as possible because it was so simple. Um, and so for me, it's like when somebody creates like a 200 page brand guideline and say, this is a good brand, it's not a good brand to me because there's so many rules that if you break one, it's consequential. And so I try to set as the least amount of rules possible to encourage people breaking it because in this context, it was about collaboration. It was about differences. And those differences are what makes the thing interesting. So when you see an ad for it, you know, you didn't really need to say Nike Lab, like created the system where it was recognizable without it. And when you don't have the word Nike Lab, you could do the thing that I mentioned with the brand, or you could use it as a way to write headlines or do signage. So now you had stores, you know, their 1948 store in London, where instead of writing Nike Lab, they could just write the name of the store. In New York, they have 21 NMYC, which is their address, but written in a cool person way. But um, you know, instead of like Nike Lab, they can now use it as a piece of signage. And so it was really about orienting things to be more kind of useful. And so if you do a book with Ricardo Tishi, which is a collaborator, they collaborated for a long time, you know, you could break that grid also, but it still says Nike Lab and it, there's no swoosh in sight. And so this was something that I was really wanting to do. And where I said, you could really break the rules. You don't even have to use the typeface I used and it's still Nike Lab. And so and this was especially useful because Nike is a big company with a lot of different geographies and a lot of different, you know, design teams. And so this was really with that kind of resilience in mind where it didn't matter if they broke the rules, if they slid something off or if they used a different typeface that, you know, what is the minimum viable brand? You know, if I had to use like kind of corporate speak, what is the, you know, what is the least amount that you could make something recognizable and part of that same family? Um, and that became more interesting me, to me than a bunch of do's and don'ts. And I think, you know, as I go through, I think all this work, um, you know, I think maybe just one last thing just for fun was, um, you know, I think, again, it's really thinking about technology where this is a client um, called The Fabricant. Um, they're making 3D clothes that you could use in video games and whatnot, and they collaborate with fashion designers. Um, and so they're dealing with a product that's actually not physical at all, or that's not material. And so, you know, do we have to think of a logo as this fixed finite thing when they're making something for like a future metaverse. And so can you have a logo that changes, you know, based on the context where you could control the weight, um, you know, you could control, you know, the width of it. And from that, you could have all these different permutations of that logo, but it still says the same thing. So whether you want to stretch the logo to fit the width of something, or, you know, if you want to have like logo just respond to content as content changes and it expands, you know, that's something really interesting for them to take advantage of. And so with that, there was still a storytelling with it. You know, it's the F, but there's a pleat. And, you know, that kind of came from, I think the whole world of fashion through like Issey Miyake and like the pleated fabric and all, but also just the visual language of circuitry, right? And so it was really a synthesis of the two, but now this was a logo that could come alive as like a pattern, but as something where they have users that might want to use their logos on their clothing that they could really adjust and really remix it to what they want. And what I tried to do was that, you know, normally if you wanted to do this interactive logo, you would have to create a proprietary app or have a web app that would do that. But, you know, recently with variable fonts, and for those who don't know, a variable font is, is a typeface now where instead of like light, you know, medium, dark, instead of these set weights, you have a slider. 
um, I could just give them a logo as a variable font. And I gave them three axes, the width, um, the weight, and how the pleat is. And it's something that they could do themselves on the web. Um, it's also just something available for them in Elsher. So it's not something that's like normal, but to me, it's just like, where would they use this brand? You know, once I finish a brand and I give it to me, I'm not in the same room as them anymore. Like what kind of software are they using? What kind of tools, what kind of context? And I think it's really about optimizing to serve these kind of, you know, these competing kind of interests more that I allow myself like, okay, I don't have to do it this certain way. I don't have to give them like a, a vector file. You know, I could give them something that, you know, might be more useful to them. And if it's something that could be, you know, inspected with CSS or changed, you know, all the more better and more useful for them. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to skip the last kind of thing, but I think just really just the idea of like creating kind of complexity from like really basic disparate parts where, you know, I think a composition to me, I, I break things down a lot into like a background, a silhouette, a shape and a color. Um, you know, I think that's a result that's specific to my experiences, right? Um, and again, I, I recognize that not everyone's gonna have the same kind of background as I might have too. But what I will say is that, you know, it seems like the dominant thing now is to try to put labels on things. Um, you're gonna have people that say like, you're specifically in communication design, so don't go into product. You're gonna have people that say like, hey, you're a Libra, Libras don't do this. And you're gonna have people that will say like, you know, like if I were a World War II tank, I'd be the student graph five, four essay. And it's like, these things are as useful as you make them, right? But I think to me, they offer why we come up with these rules is just as interesting of what these actual rules are. And I think of it like a ship where if you're, if you're on a ship, you know, you have a compass that might tell you where to go a two degree difference over a huge amount of time might put you in a whole different country. Like if you just maybe just shift over to the right and instead of, and if you went a straight line, you know, in an hour I'd end up on a whole different side of town than if I just didn't rotate and just went straight there, right? Over time, having kind of rules and having ways that you do things and thinking about it like that, um, it's really helpful over time. But when it gets to these individual specific situations, like I said, where maybe you draw a perfect circle, it doesn't matter because your eye's not gonna perceive it as a perfect circle. Rules tend to break down in these specific kind of instances, right? When you're dealing with a single assignment, this is where rules, you know, the things that you believe in don't make sense anymore. But it's over time, you know, as I start to like look back through just like the 15 years that I've done design, you know, I start to see patterns, I start to see practices. And I'm not here to tell you what is some, you know, what is a practice that you have to engage in? What is a rule to follow? What is something, I'm not even telling you what are the rules that help me. And I think the whole point is, is that to get you to think like, why do people have defaults? Why do people have tools? And why do tools have defaults? And I think, you know, it's through that, that you're gonna get a lot closer to finding something that works for you over time than to just blindly kind of accept something at face value. And so, um, you know, I think through all my life, I've tried to look for a good definition of design with that in mind. And people say like good design is minimal. And this is why I say it's wrong, right? Again, tell a Persian rug that less is more. But the one definition that I found that has something that I'm comfortable with that I, that I could say is true in almost any situation that I've been in is that good design gives more than it takes. It doesn't assume that the person is dumb. So it doesn't water itself down and make it overly accessible where it's pretentious, but it also doesn't exclude them through pretentiousness. You know, it, it's a fine line that you have to hit, but I think if somebody walks away having engaged and interacted with what you made, um, a more fuller, a more educated, a better person than they were when they got that, I think you're onto something pretty close. And then that's where I'll leave things as they are. So thank you all, um, it was my pleasure. So I know it's six o'clock, so everyone needs to head out, but they head out. But we will do like 10, 15 minutes of QA if you yeah. want to stick around. Um, you can just raise your hand. We do have a couple of people in Zoom. So if you have a question, just type it in the chat and we can ask it to them. So yeah, if anyone has questions, just raise their hand. Do you have a question?
Who goes back to it? Uh, so you mentioned that like tools before that Bart can make. Are there any like tools, digital or analog, that you really like influence your own work? And any tools that like in the like the near future, next couple years, you think that like point towards your future practice? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think there's obvious ones where it's like if one person designs with a 3D software and one person designs exclusively in Ele Illustrator, it's going to be one thing. But I think one thing was like the thing I mentioned where um, I was using this typeface design software called Glyphs, and it was really helpful. But because that there was a circle and a rectangle tool built in, it was something that I relied on. So I created typefaces that were modular or geometric, where it's like a bunch of rectangles and circles repeated in a patch. And then when I moved to RoboFont, when it was like, uh, no, sweetie, you're going to have to draw your own curves. Um, that was really difficult to work with at first, but it resulted in letter forms that were much more organic or humanist or, or based in like a specific archetype or cultural canon. Um, and so I even think it's just things like that too, where like what I do sometimes is like, I go to Photoshop and I just try out every single tool. Like I just right click and just do everything and just see like, why is this the default? And then I think we will find out that even in something like Photoshop, in most tools, they'll let you change the settings of it. So don't just do the default drop shadow, like look into the drop shadow and they'll see like, oh, you could change the width or the height or the blend mode or that. And like, what does this do? And what, why is it different than others? And why did they make this the default? You know, and what does that do? And I think it was just really kind of poking and prodding that that was really interesting. I think, you know, also like if you learn how to code, um, you're going to create a very different website than if you use like a, a software where you design your website by hand, like Webflow, for example. And so learning to code um, just throughout the years was also something that impacted my work a lot too. And so I think, you know, it's really like if you step in a whole different software and again, there's so many options now, uh, way more options than before in some ways, um, you know, it's, we're, we're really entering in like a, second renaissance with tools like where you don't have to work with Adobe at all if you don't want to, you know, um, there's a replacement for each software in the Adobe suite, despite them having bought out Macromedia, you know, a decade beforehand. And so really just download a demo and see if something works better for you, see if it, you know, creates something like, I think another one was like drawing, um, I did an, an album cover on the iPad recently, and it was not on the computer. And I, and that was really interesting to working something with Procreate with my hands. Um, and no computer at all. But you know that if you know a tool, nobody's gonna take that away from you. And so I didn't always stay completely in um, you know, that software, but I stayed 80% of it. And so the final thing I, you know, I cleaned it up in Photoshop, but it got me to a much more different place in my work than I did if I went out of it. And so I had this teacher, Meryl Pollen. Um, she's actually, I believe she's a graduate of CMU. Like she did her undergrad here decades ago, but you know, she taught. Um, typography for me and she had this piece of advice where because it's your eye and it's you know those optical illusions that I mentioned she would say like when you're about 80 percent done turn your grid off because then you'll just go by your eye and you'll go by your intuition and you'll go by your feeling but you did most of the work with this rationality with a structure to it so it's okay you know like the big kind of gestures are in place now you could just turn it off so even within the same tools if you notice there's a pattern you do you know, it's like, what is something that I could turn off when it's 80% done that I'm just used to doing? I think that's also will unlock just like kind of a new visual language for you that you could use as well. Hi, uh, yes. I was curious, you know, like very much that what, what this presentation is interesting talking about like rules and rather than breaking them and just pushing them and seeing like how far you can get them to go. And I was wondering, I mean, what are other rules that you feel like you encounter a lot and that you're always trying to push at? I think um, when they say like good design needs to be legible or good design needs to be accessible, like I think whenever you hear something needs to be accessible, what's not spoken is that there's a whole history between that word accessible and there's a whole almost like shared belief of what is accessible. Um, and, you know, when something might be easy, when you, when you, especially if you work in tech, you know, you might go to like a big company like Facebook, Apple, Google, and you might hear a bunch of things where it's like, this is best practices. This is what we have found with data and with users. But, you know, it's, this is where it's good to ask like, okay, if everybody around me is like, like a, you know, an Anglo-Saxon looking white person, like male, 
like maybe that there's a blind spot that they have that doesn't really account for this, that what they think is accessible or objective or neutral is actually just them treating their own biases as the default. And so an example of that um, is like the idea that something should be approachable or friendly. Like if you make apps, you're gonna be told that a lot, whether it's a client or your manager or your supervisor, right? And so Facebook followed that to a T, but then you have a situation where neo-Nazis are on the platform, right? And so if, you're, if their app makes what you write friendly and approachable, and now you have a neo-Nazi person on that platform, suddenly their message is friendlier and approachable just because of how it looks. You know, you look in science fiction movies and you're gonna see like evil corporations, right? And they're gonna be set in like Euro style as a typeface. They're gonna be black and white, like Wayland Corporation or, you know, Oscorp. And like, it's not really like that. Like sometimes like the most evil companies are use the colors of the rainbow, you know? And so a lot of times it's like, it's not really the rules. It's like the enforcement of those rules where something has to be this way that's where you actually really see these human kind of biases and these components. And so, you know, the idea of being accessible and friendly and approachable is like a really easy one. And so at some point, if you're making something really, really easy, um, there's also consequences. Like, you know, like should a gambling app be easy and approachable, you know? Like those are values that you see as like objective, like user growth scalability, but really sometimes, it's really sad because I don't think it's completely the designer's responsibility to enforce these things, but just as a designer, sometimes you're the last line of defense. Do I think design could save the world? I don't think so, but I think design can make the world a lot less shitty. And this is something that you're gonna encounter a lot too. Like if you work at a fashion company and you have to do an art direction in a campaign, well, it's like, are we gonna make a teenager ashamed of their body? Like by who we cast as a model or who we choose or how it's shot? You know, and it's like, there's nobody you could cast or there's no way to art direct it that's going to make somebody suddenly believe in world peace, for example. It's not going to turn a fundamentalist extremist into a more moderate person, but you might have just stopped somebody from feeling shitty about their body. And so, you know, visuals are all around us and we live in a much more visually literate society than before, for better or worse. But I think it's really just, you know, asking the whys, you know, no matter where you are, in your field of work and what you do. I think that's one of the most critical and most important things a designer can do. Hi, yes. Uh, I just wanted to give you your thoughts. I'm curious, you're so inspired. Oh, thank you. But, I appreciate uh, that. Maybe this is a bit of a selfish question. Yeah. But I am curious to hear about like after school, what you were thinking you wanted to do, what yeah. you thought it would be like, and how that has sort of changed for you. Yeah, you know, um, I was so worried about what I was going to be after I graduated that I held it back for two years with grad school, you know, and what I realized was that when I graduated grad school, what I wanted had completely changed from what I wanted as an undergrad person. Um, you know, just simply like I wanted to be the cool designer when I graduated and work at a museum and do books for artists. And then I went to a grad school that was specialized in pushing out, you know, graduates that did that. But I think over there, I realized that I didn't want that at all. And I believed in, I hated like how people were dis distinguishing themselves. There's like underground art and then there was mainstream art. I hated that distinction at the time. And I thought that like, you could truly be transcendent. Like, you know, that you can make something just because something is pop doesn't mean it has to be unintelligent. That, you know, you can make something accessible and mainstream but really confront and challenge that person. And so I think, it's not about like what you want as a student. I think that definitely matters, but just know that you're open to changing themselves and like, you don't have to pick a lane to stick in forever. And that, you know, in school, you're gonna learn a lot of how to's and softwares and tutorials. And those tools will be obsolete the moment you graduate, you know, and what, what does it stay behind? And what are some of the bigger pictures that you could draw? And so I think for what helped me was just to like, hang out with a bunch of different people, have a diverse group of friends, but just also know that like, you don't have to stick to something, you know? And this is something that was important for me culturally too, because I already pissed my parents off by wanting to be an artist or going to school. And so it was really about like, hey, you have to pick a commercially viable route. You have to do this. And I'm not gonna say that life doesn't get in the way, you know, your student loans, all these things are things you think about and you make a, a calculus on what, um, you know, but I think just open yourself. Like if you look back at yourself four years ago, 
completely different person. There's probably just even from a design standpoint, things you did in your sophomore year that would make you cringe right now. But what we're really bad at as human beings is extrapolating that for our future. I think when we think of ourselves five years from now, I don't know how many of you actually do that, you know, but if you do that, you might picture yourself not that different, just a better version of who you are now. But you know that, you know, just as how much you've changed four years ago, you have the capacity to change even more in the next four years. And so the idea that like things are set in stone, I think that's really the problem. And so if I had to have any advice, it's, you know, have strong opinions, but loosely, but strong opinions loosely held. You know, that you could have conviction, you could have an opinion like, this is what I want, this is what I like. But the moment you get new information, the moment you get new data, you get some of the most powerful things you could do as a human being is to say like, oh, I'm wrong. I'm gonna change, you know, I'm gonna change my framework because I have new information. And that's something that we don't do a lot as human beings. And so I would say that skill is much more important than whatever specific design thing, you know, a class could offer you as well. Uh, yeah. Eric, thank you for being here. I know everybody's been saying, but I want to echo that. I also want to thank everybody for coming. This is just like makes me so happy. I kind of like five or six empty seats. So thank you guys all for coming. Can you speak a little bit about self-initiated work? Um, compared yeah. to client work, how how much of your practice is dedicated to to yourself and what how that informs you as a designer, how important that is to you? Yeah, I think um I think self-initiated work, it's not something that came naturally. Like, I think just because of how we all work as design, like you're so used to solving other people's problems that when it comes to yourself, it's somehow like, what do I want? Um, it's like, like the hardest thing for a lot of designers to brand is like their own website or their own portfolio. Like that ends up being something that is hard. But I think what happened over the years is that, um, like I said, I started questioning, right? And the whole difference between self-initiated work is that like, you're trying to answer the things that your clients haven't asked you yet. You know, topics and things that you're interested in, but you haven't had the chance for somebody to come along and ask you. I think a lot of my self-initiated work, it's not, there's no really kind of magical spell to it. You know, it's just that like, if there happened to have been the right client that came along, it could have been client work. But I think over time, as you start building your own vocabulary and your own kind of grammar, you're inevitably going to have some questions and you might not have a situation where, you know, it's appropriate for a client. And I think that's another thing about maturing and growing up is that sometimes like, you know, there's this temptation where it's like, I got to kill it. Right. But maybe that's not fair to your client who just maybe just wants to open a, a flower shop. And so maybe it's not necessarily generous of you to try to question the boundaries of Western perception through this person's flower shop, you know, maybe what's more helpful for this person who might be working class or just trying to get a business off the ground is that you just make a good flower shop where other people can look at it and say, that does not look like a teriyaki chicken restaurant. So, you know, you, you hit the mark. And so, but I think if you do that a lot, um, you know, if you're curious, there's probably going to be some restlessness and something comes along. And I think all we're doing as we're going along in this journey, whether you're an educator or a student or a practitioner um, or all three at, you know, at once is that we're just collecting. We're collecting a list of references culturally. We're collecting a list of tips and tricks with our tools. We're also collecting a list of just topics, themes and motifs that you might wanna explore that you haven't had the chance to. And I think that's what it comes down with self-initiated work. I think there's a lot of fetishism with self-initiated work where that's the only place where you can be an author and be yourself. But I don't really, I never really cared about that. Like, I don't really care about the plot of a movie. I care more about how that movie is made. Like I care more about the cinematography, the acting, like I could read the Wikipedia spoilers and it doesn't really affect my enjoyment of it, right? But some people are really drawn to that story. And so for them, self-initiated work is like, Here's a subject matter that I want to explore that I haven't had the client work to do. But for me, a lot of times it's like, I want to try a new technique. I want to try this and that. Um, and there's really no right or wrong way to go after it. But I think like, you know, I if I had to give one kind of practical piece of advice for people who are on the cusp of graduating is that the work you show is the work you end up getting hired for, for better or worse. And so I have a lot of friends and I myself early on were 
we weren't getting hired for the things we wanted to do. And it's like, why is that? And I looked at my portfolio and it's like, well, why do I have like all this corporate identity if I want to do less corporate identity? Well, I, I was scared because as a student, they're telling you, you got to get a job. You got to show this. You got to demonstrate that, you know, motion graphics and that, you know, Figma and that you did that. And so I had a bunch of these projects where this is a show this and this is show that. And that's really useful when you're starting out school. But I think over time as a designer, as you get comfortable in your job or as people are confident enough to trust you, you might not need these insecure kind of theater portfolio theater as much anymore. And you get to see it. And so but this is the thing too, where you might end up in a situation a few years from now where it's like, hey, you know, people are hiring me to do websites because I come from the web design world, but I really want to do branding. And that's exactly what I felt, but all my portfolio was all websites at one point. And so I did the hard thing of just like, I'm not going to show websites anymore. And was it hard? Um, yeah, because, you know, like I stopped getting web design work, which is my bread and butter. So I stopped getting certain word of mouth. but, you know, it's not a thing you do overnight where it's like, what I had was like, I'm just going to do a logo on the weekend or a piece of lettering. And when I like it, I'm going to trade one website project on my portfolio for this logo project. And then I started doing that kind of slowly and it took a little while, but now, you know, self-initiated work matters a lot less to me now because I'm in the, I'm grateful enough and fortunate enough to be in a position where, you know, most of my clients are on the kind of same frequency as I am. And they're hiring me specifically for my graphic language. And so I know that gets, that gets like fetishized a lot. Like there's a whole myth of the rock star designer and stuff. You have to know that most of your favorite design heroes, there's way more work that they're not showing that they did for money than there is on their website. The website is curated for the projects, but you know, I do things for like Taco Bell and Trader Joe's and I, I won't show that to the world, but you know what? It, it pays me a decent amount of money. And so that lets me take a certain time off and I get to now be more picky with my self-initiated or client work because now I don't have to worry about paying rent. But some people, because when they see these designer portfolio websites, they're like, well, they only do work like that. So I want to be like that too. And they end up in this position where it's hard because they have to pay the bills and they have to put the lights on. So they end up in these compromising positions where, okay, this is the highest paying client that will kind of let me do what I want, but it's never like a hundred percent what you really want. Like if you think a lot of my classmates thought, like if I work at this cool New York, small little studio, that'll be the work I want. And then they hated it because they still had a boss. They still had to do what they had to do. And guess what? They got stuck with the projects that wasn't on that agency's website, you know? And so you deal with that nonetheless. But what I felt was helpful was just learning that like, sometimes I do the things that I don't want to do because it gives me more permission or more of a right or more freedom or time to do the things that I want to do. And I think if I knew that when I was about to graduate, that would have saved a lot of heartbreak and a lot of disappointment. And so I don't know if that consistently makes sense, but I think like the whole point of it is, is that, you know, your website, your portfolio, you know, it's just as much of a design problem to curate it. Right. And so, but you don't have to feel pressured that like your portfolio is your identity that like, when you look at somebody's portfolio, that's not all the work they do. It's very rare that it is all the work they do. It's a very curated selection, but you could use that to your advantage. You could use that to attract the people who's, who you think would resonate with your work and the work you wanna do without showing the other things and just keep a separate hidden password protected PDF or, a, or another URL. You know, If your name is like John Henry, you could have johnhenry.design for your cool stuff and you can have johnhenry.studio for your more corporate stuff. And that's kind of how I, I did it. But I think, you know, long story short, it's really, you know, the things you think are set in stone are most likely not set in stone. And it's really just how you take advantage of how things are presented and told. And that's really just a fundamental design problem that everybody has to deal with, no matter what. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one more. Uh, you mentioned when you were going to LA, you were inspired a lot by Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think, you know, it's just something that's just been so a part of me that it's kind of just ingrained where it's like, you know, when I'll do a piece of art or I'll do a piece of design and, you know, I think it has nothing to do with graffiti at all, but I think another person will take a look at it and it's like, that feels a lot more like graffiti or street or punk than they would have thought where it's like, you know, I think the act of graffiti and making images feel painter-like and image-like or just even just lettering. I think, you know, this is something where it's like, I wasn't trying to copy graffiti, but I think just 
that's all the kind of influences that I had. You know, you kind of just do it without even thinking of it sometimes. But I think as you grow older too, you also just have a wider cachet. You realize that like, if you're only looking at a specific slice of life, you might only output a specific slice of life. And I think, you know, the more experiences that you have, that's better. But it's also just like the more experiences you have, the more you'll know what, what's you and what's not you, I think too. As we think of one or two more questions, Mm -hmm. Lexi, was there anything on Zoom to add? Uh, nope. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? There's one. I see a hand. Hi. I, I realized that um, you talk a really really briefly about making work that feels someone else forgot how you said it, but like the your graduate work, the video where you walk. Yeah. Your walk. Um, I'm really interested in that sort of stuff, but I think this would be cool. Um, do you have any other projects like that that you have done when you like or like even inspired by? Around? Yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, not in this deck. It, it might have, and I actually don't know where I would find it online. But in grad school, I did a lot of things. But I could just kind of describe it briefly. Where, you know, I, I made this website that was getting webcam feeds across the world, and on and whenever you logged in on the website, it showed you. Um, on the, on the left side was a webcam feed of a city going through a sunrise. And the right side was a city somewhere around the world going through a sunset. And so, you know, it was using the power of the web to just really just feel and just be more present about your physical world and surroundings. Um, you know, I think a lot of it was also just like drawing software where it's like, again, like that physical kind of feeling. But I think if you wanna look more into it, um, Abstracting Craft is the most helpful book that I ever read about it. It's by Malcolm McCullough. Um, it's a little bit dense, but he just talks about like, you know, when you use a tool really well, it's going to feel like an extension of your body. They, you know, scientifically, you look at surgeons who work with like these tiny little like tools all day, like, and they're like ro remote control and like a, a neurosurgeon, for example, they say it feels just like a part of their body. And when you interview like a Formula One race driver, when they're so familiar with the car, it feels just like an extension of them too. And that's just this beautiful thing about being human is that we adapt really quickly and we start to form mental models around the world that um, we really look at. I think also just a more practical one is um, if you Google like a mental model of JavaScript, there's like this really interesting course that just really teaches you like coding and computer science and, and really puts it in this like really tangible kind of way. But I think, you know, it's, it's, it's human created. And so there's always gonna be like this mark of a human. I think it gets a bad rap of like, you know, design that's digital feels impersonal or not physical. But sometimes it's like, you know, when you draw something on a paper and you make a squiggle, we call it a mistake. But then I think if you think about it technically, it's like, if you do the same thing on software, like I guess we're drawing on the mouse, it's a mistake as a human being, but it's actually not that software is doing exactly as it was programmed to. It's just really not forgiving, but when you use um, a pencil, you know, because of how the pencil is, it's more forgiving than this. And you realize that every medium has a set of affordances and limitations, whether it's a physical or a digital medium, it's really, you could just think about affordances and limitations. And when you start to just inter interrogate, like what's a limitation here and what's an affordance, that's I think when you get to start making interesting connections and where things start to feel like a lot more tangible. And whatnot too. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much.